Well, welcome to Technologies Education. So in this course, you're going to be learning about how to teach and all about the um, learning area of technologies. So before we get into that, just a bit of an idea of the course you're involved in. These are the various cohorts that are um, learning about technologies education this semester. And hopefully you'll find yourself as one of those. Now it is possible to move between cohorts, but it's not recommended because you do want to get to know your tutors um, and they'll be predominantly assessing you. And also you get to know your peers and you'll be working with them a lot on the various activities that you'll be doing during the tutorials. So we have a teaching team this uh, semester. Uh, myself, I'm Dr. Jason Zagami. I'll be convening the course and also providing the lectures. And we also have Jackie on the Gold Coast, Siren at Logan, Catherine at Malkovat, and Trent and Margaret taking various online sessions. So together we'll be leading you through your journey into technologies education. Oops. So the course is structured around lessons and tutorials. The lessons are asynchronous videos, such as this one, um, in which you'll work through the material, but there'll also be various pauses during the lecture where you'll access other material and do um, surveys and quizzes and interactivities to make it a little bit more interesting. Of course, there's a lot of content. Um, technologies education and particular digital technologies is something that's quite new to you. Most of you haven't studied um, technologies education as it is currently taught in primary schools. Um, because you would have gone through at a different time in our curriculum processes and things have changed quite dramatically over the last few years. So there'll be lots for you to learn and in particular you're going to be learning about things that you've never actually learnt yourself. Now this is very different to all of the other learning areas where essentially you are teaching things that you've already learnt yourself. In this course, in this subject, in this learning area, there will be material that you are going to have to teach that you've never learnt yourself. And that imposes some additional challenges. And we're going to do our best to try to help prepare you for that. Now that said, it's not really scary, difficult stuff. Certainly some of the big picture concepts that we're going to explore are quite, quite difficult. Um, but when it comes down to the activities that you're going to be doing with your students, once you've framed them in that big picture um, environment, the activities themselves are relatively simple. They are designed for young children, so you should be able to cope with them. But that said, guiding their learning through the use of those simple activities, that's the job of a teacher, and that's really difficult. And we're going to be going through how you can address that. So to assist with that, each week in the lectures, you'll explore various concepts, particularly the big picture thinking school concepts, Exploring the Australian curriculum, which defines what it is we're to teach. Going through various activities and looking at various resources that are there to help you understand these concepts and activities in more detail. And doing a range of learning activities, what we call active learning activities, to break up the information dump so that you're actually doing something rather than just passively absorbing information or not absorbing it, as the case may be. Now, then to make things more concrete and to give you more applied advice, we have the tutorials. Now, in the tutorials, you'll have a one hour session where you're going to then do some of these activities. Practice what you're being shown how to teach. So much of them are done as if you were students. But of course, being teacher educators, we'll also frame that around how you would teach these various activities and how you would go about linking them to the learning outcomes and the high water thinking skills that we want to really achieve in technologies education. And we've got a wide range of very experienced tutors to assist you in that process. Now, these will be very hands-on activities. Um, and for those studying online, they will also be rather hands-on. And there'll be a little bit of equipment you'll need to get. Um, the main one is a glue gun and things like that, but I'll go through in that more detail a bit later. Um, so there'll be some things you'll need to actually do online, 
and then you'll share that in the online sessions and also through various other mechanisms. Which leads us into the favorite topic of all courses, assessment. So I've tried to make the assessment as applicable to what you're learning about and how you're learning it as possible. So there's two main assessment items. The first is what's called a portfolio of learning, which is simply a, a portfolio of evidence of how you've of what you've learnt, um, showing that you've understood certain things. So the main part of that is the digital technologies lesson plan. Only one lesson plan, only for one of the one aspect of the course, but that's a pretty significant one. Then you'll also supplement that with four challenges. Um, each week in the tutorials, you're going to be doing various challenges. So you're going to do lots and lots of challenges. Um, you're going to select four of those, and then you're going to unpack them in more detail, exploring how you would teach them, how you would make them better, more effective, um, using various resources and so forth. But they'll be based upon the activities that have been modeled in the tutorials. So that's the portfolio of learning. That is criteria based, which means you'll be given a mark and as to how well you've addressed the criteria in responding to those particular um, assessment challenges. And then we have the log of learning activities. Now this isn't criteria based. This is based upon your completion of the activities. Now this is a little bit different to many of you in how you may have experienced some of the assessment, particularly here in tertiary environments. So two main aspects of this. The first is what are called uh, completion activities, which is where you demonstrate evidence that you've actually done the activities from the tutorials each week. Now you'll be able to take screenshots and photos and all the rest and submit those as evidence. Now, we're not marking you on the quality of the evidence. How well you've done the activity is not the focus of this assessment item. It is that you have done the activity. So a little bit different. You're simply given marks for having done the activity. So you think, great, that sounds really easy. Well, in reality, it is. Um, in practice, actually doing them all and doing them each week, because they have to be completed before the next tutorial, does pose certain challenges for some students. So hopefully you'll be able to manage your time and you'll be able to address those learning activities and provide evidence and get the marks for them. Then we also have, to make it a little bit more difficult, um, four quizzes. Now, every three weeks, there'll be a quiz. So they're sort of unitized. And you need to do those four quizzes and you'll receive marks based upon how well you complete the quizzes. Now, to make it a little bit different, you can do the quizzes as many times as you want. And it will count the best score of all the attempts you've made at the quizzes. And the quizzes are open book. You can use whatever resources you want. They are timed um, and they are randomized. So you don't see the exact same sequence of questions or even indeed sometimes the same questions each time to make it a little bit challenging. But they will assess how well you've understood the various concepts and content that are presented during the course. So that's the assessment. There'll be more details on the course website um, and during the course we'll provide you more advice around that as you progress. Okay, well, the other thing I should mention is we'll also be using the Microsoft Teams environment. Now, particularly for our online students, that's where you'll be doing your interactions with your tutor, but we'll also be using it for sharing um, ideas and discussing various concepts during the course and you'll be using it to um, show evidence of your completion of various activities. Now, unfortunately, Teams doesn't allow us to do full tracking of all of your evidence. So you do actually have to share the evidence in two locations. One on Teams so that we can all see it and um, engage with the wonderful work that you're doing. And you'll also have to submit that evidence into um, Microsoft, uh, sorry, uh, Blackboard, um, learning at Griffith. So there'll be two submission points for all of your evidence um, that you're 
completing for your tutorial activities. So it's the same stuff, you just submit twice, but unfortunately we don't have one unified environment that we can incorporate for both at this stage. We will have next year, but things are just progressing in that space. So what are we going to do this week? This week we're looking at the curriculum and there's a lot of curriculum to look at. And it's, it's not the most exciting aspect of the course, but it probably is the most important. Um, you do need to understand all of this curriculum so that you can essentially teach it. And of course, I could just rely upon you reading it, but for better or for worse, sometimes students don't always engage with those readings as effectively as I would like. So I'm going to take you through it. And there's a lot to go through. So we're going to go through fairly quickly. Um, and in later weeks, we're going to unpack various essential aspects of the curriculum in more detail, particularly around the content next week. Then we're going to explore how to teach it in terms of the pedagogy. Then we're going to look at the thinking skills in a lot more detail. And then the second half of the course is essentially set aside to looking at activities that you would then do with your students um, that address the various elements of the curriculum. But for this week, you need to understand the curriculum. And at the, at the end of it all, in order to uh, prepare you for your tutorials, you're going to create a mind map or an infographic that summarizes all of the material that I'm about to go through. So, of course, you can come back and look at this video as many times as you want, but you may want to start taking some notes or structuring um, things as you progress through to create an infographic or mind map that you'll then be able to submit and will be used in your tutorials to help um, you and your tutor unpack your understanding of the curriculum. Okay, so we're going to address this through five stories. Having data dumps of information is not that exciting and we don't tend to retain it particularly well. So one strategy around better engagement with the learning process is to do things through storytelling. We've been doing storytelling for millennia and it tends to help us understand things a little bit better. So our first story is going to be around why we have this technologies learning area at all. We didn't used to have it when you probably went through school or certainly not in its structure as it is now. Why do we need it now? What's, what's its purpose? Then we're going to look at this subject called designer technology. What, it, what does it involve? Then we're going to talk about how the digital technologies subject exists, the general capabilities, and the cross-curriculum priorities. So very much focused on the Australian curriculum and all of the essential elements that it includes that we need to make sure that you are teaching when you get out in front of your wonderful students. So let's get started. Why do we have technologies education? Well, first off, what is technology? A lot of students don't really understand what technology is. Now, some of you may be thinking, oh, OK, it might be my smartphone. But let's take an ex let's take a student, Sally. So Sally has come to this course and she's pretty good at technology. She's got a smartphone. She keeps in contact with all of her friends via mobile apps, um, social media apps. She's got a laptop. She types all her assignments up. She reckons she's pretty good at com uh, computers and technology. She, she shows her grandmother how to use email and Facebook and video conferencing and all the rest. And she reckons she's pretty au fait. But Sally doesn't really understand how important technology has been to humanity. Unfortunately, many of us don't really appreciate the vast contribution that technology has made to society. Now, on the course website, I've provided a little timeline that you can go through and get a little bit better appreciation of the scope of technology. Now, and this is just educational technologies, technologies that relate to teaching and learning. There's lots and lots of other technologies that relate to all other spheres of human endeavor. But just in relation to teaching and learning, there's a whole lot of technologies, starting with speech. Speech is a technology. Then over time, we developed writing. 
We developed fire and a few other technologies not related specifically to education. But in terms of education, we developed um, cave paintings and used that for instruction. Then we developed methods of communication and writing. Eventually, we developed a book. That made a huge change. And then over time, we developed various um, new ways of doing things. We developed technologies called schools and universities. These are all technologies, ways, human constructs that have been applied to solve problems, to do things differently. And then, of course, we had more advances in technology. We had vehicles and planes and spacecraft. But in education, we had data projectors, the Internet, a whole range of technologies that have had massive changes. But this is what we talk about when we when we discuss technologies, particularly design and technologies. Digital technologies really does take us into the last 50 or so years. But before that, we've got a wealth of technologies spanning back from the beginning of humankind. And much of that is what we're going to be teaching students about. Of course, we're not going to teach them all. There's just too many technologies. But we're going to teach the fundamentals so that students have a better appreciation of technology. But most importantly, and this is something that Sally coming to this course had no idea about. We're going to teach students about how to make new technologies. It's not about learning about past technologies. We do a little bit of that, but only to set the context so that Sally can teach her students how to create, how to make new technologies that solve problems. Now, this was quite an eye opener for Sally. Sally thought, oh, We'll make some cakes and make a bookcase and learn how to make a website and maybe use a robot or two and things like that. And we do those things, but it's why we do them. We do them so that we can enable our students to be creators of technology and to solve problems with technology. And we're going to explore that. So in terms of that context, Sally got all excited and thinks, oh, okay, great. We're going to be able to have our students do some really wonderful things. But it's not all rosy. Some of the reasons why we need Sally and yourselves to be able to do these things is because if we don't, the future is rather bleak. We're facing a lot of challenges in the world, lots of problems, and many of those problems need to be addressed through technology. Some of them shouldn't be addressed through technology, and that's also a big part of technology's education, knowing when to use technology and when not to use technology. But in the main, we focus on how to enable our students to be able to use technology to make the world a better place. But there are lots of challenges coming up. Artificial intelligence, bioengineering, genetic engineering, lots of really big fundamental challenges around the environment and how our society is going to govern itself. And these are, and many other things are part of technology's education. But there are lots of opportunities then that arise from this. And that's the positive aspect. So while we've got the negative aspect, Sally also needs to look at those positive aspects, how to engage our students with technologies so that they can make the world a better place, so that they can and know that they can shape the future. And that's a big thing. So many of our students, so many of our teachers don't feel empowered when it comes to the future. And that's a really bad place to be. Of course, if we don't feel empowered to be able to make changes, then we'll simply accept whatever changes come. And not all those changes will be positive. OK. So the first thing for Sally to understand is that we have two subjects. We mentioned them already, design and technologies. And in this, we focus on design thinking and creating design solutions. And we have digital technologies, where we focus on a term called computational thinking. And we use information systems and computational thinking to create digital solutions to, to problems. So it's all around creating solutions. So when Sally is with her class, sitting them down and taking them through a technologies lesson, 
It's about having students create solutions to problems. That's the fundamental touchstone of everything to do with technology's education. And if students aren't creating solutions to problems and using technology to do so, then you're not really doing technology's education. Now that said, there's lots of things we do to enable students to be able to create solutions to problems. But that always has to be our clear primary focus. Oops. Okay. So, as I've talked a little bit about, we look at traditional technologies. Those that have happened in the past, we look at um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have used technologies, or how ancient Egyptians used technologies. We also look at contemporary technologies, the technologies we're currently using. And then we also look at future technologies, the emerging technologies, those that are going to happen during your students' lifetimes. How is Sally going to prepare her students to face even more fundamental changes than the internet has occurred during your lifetime? When I started teaching, there was no internet, or not as we know it now. That's all been a change since I started. We were still using blackboards. <laughs> Digital projectors didn't exist. You couldn't go up onto the internet and search for a lesson plan. The teaching I came into teach, teaching into was very different to what Sally now faces and what you now face. But the point is, just as that has been a significant change in the last 25, 30 years, just as, if not even more, significant change is going to happen in the, in the time your students enter the workplace. And you need to prepare them for that change. That is what technology's education is about. Enabling your students to be able to cope with, embrace and engage positively with those changes. So there's many different ways of doing this and many schools adopt different approaches to teaching technologies as a learning area. Um, often we will integrate the two subjects together, but we can also integrate with other learning areas. A transdisciplinary approach, as this is known, um, is often referred to as STEM, where we take science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Um, generally, we ignore engineering. We just put technology and engineering together. Um, they didn't really think through the acronym particularly well when they designed it. But STEM is very, a very popular uh, framework. Now, sometimes it's also expanded to include the arts. We call it STEAM. Um, I don't quite like that framework. I think the arts and the humanities have their own place and shouldn't really be relegated to a, to a subsection of STEM, but that's just a particular um, approach. But the key thing is, particularly in primary schools, wherever possible, we should try to teach everything together, contextualized, um, rather than siloed as we do in secondary schooling. And you'll hear a lot about this during your teacher education program. Oops. Okay. So technologies can enrich and impact the lives of societies globally. They can be transforming, restoring, sustaining, and we can create natural managed and constructed environments. So technologies essentially can be everything and everywhere. We want our students to be enterprising, make discerning decisions, develop solutions, and have sustainable patterns of living so that we can survive on this planet. So that not only Sally can live to a nice old age with lots of comfortable technological innovations, but so can our students. And to do that, our students need to be, have the capacity for action to be able to actually influence the world and have a critical appreciation for how technologies develop and contribute. So, you're starting to see, hopefully, just as Sally did, that this is quite an all-encompassing subject. It's not just making bookcases and websites and things of that nature. We're trying to change students' attitudes and approaches to how they engage with the future. And that's a, that's a challenge, particularly for some of our disadvantaged students. 
Okay. But we want to do this in a fun way as well. And in technologies education, we do that through making it practical. Essentially, almost everything is done in through practical activities and what we call projects. Now, these aren't the projects you may have experienced when you were very young, where you got a big sheet of paper and you posted it up and you showed the whales and how the whales live and all the stuff about whales on a sheet of paper. No, projects are very different in technologies education. Projects are designed to solve a problem. And we're going to go through what's called the project development life cycle and a whole lot of other approaches to project-based learning as we explore technologies education. But we want students to be able to critically and creatively come up with these solutions. So creative solutions, all well and good, but critical solutions. So students need to think through what problems could this solution actually cause? Technology can cause problems. Social media is causing problems. Various screen devices are causing problems. We need to think about those so that we create our solutions more beneficially. And of course, some of these problems are going to be complex. Um, easy problems are simple to solve. It's the tough problems, the complex problems, or what we call the wicked problems. They're the ones that really require effort. And hopefully some of your students and some of Sally's students will solve these. Otherwise, the world's in a bit of a sorry state. But in the past, we have had students that have graduated from classes just like Sally's and gone on to, to change the world, to create vaccines, various medical innovations, various societal innovations, such as democracy. Lots of different ways that we can make the world better through innovation. But that involves experimentation, problem solving, prototyping, creating prototypes, um, small working models, and evaluation to work out whether or not the solution is effective. So students need to be doing things, be active in their learning. And they'll eventually transform their ideas into solutions to problems. And that's the point of technology's education. Okay, so I talked about that um, design or that process of creating solutions. And we call this the design cycle, where students investigate, investigate the problem they want to solve, the skills they've got, all the different circumstances around the problem, what the people being impacted by the problem want to have happen. Then they design solutions, not just one solution, but a range of solutions. They then plan through how they would be, that would be managed, how they would create the solution. They decide upon one of their designs as the most likely to then implement. They then manage the design process and the construction process of the solution, often in teams where they have to manage their team and collaborate and communicate and share resources and all the rest. They create the solution and then they evaluate it. Has it actually solved the problem? And we then go through an iterative process of then improving upon that, going through the cycle again. Whoops. Other aspects of technologies aims for students to be creative, innovative and enterprising. Um, using a range of traditional, contemporary and emerging technologies. And also understand how technology changes over time. Now, we're quite familiar with that with things like mobile phones. Every year or so, a new mobile phone comes out. Often not with much change anymore, but they did once upon a time have fairly significant change. But technologies change, and we need to understand that. All technologies slowly improve and change, sometimes more quickly than others. And we can make iterative improvements. Again, back to that design cycle. We've come up with a solution, we evaluate it, then how can we improve upon that? How can we make it better? In writing, we call this a drafting process. In technologies education, we call it iterative design. We want our students to make informed and ethical decisions about the impact of technologies so that we don't make technologies that end up being bad. Um, we've got a range of those in the world. Uh, chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, most weapons. Um, <laughs> 
But there's also been other mistakes that we've made at various times, particularly in medicine and um, even foods. Um, fast food is a fantastic innovation, nice and cheap. It allows lots of people to have convenience, but it also has resulted in an obesity em epidemic. So we need to consider the impact upon our of our technologies on our own lives, on others, on the economy, on the environment, and whether or not it'll be sustainable. Does it use too many, too many resources? Is it going to destroy the planet? Once upon a time, that might have been a rhetorical question. Nowadays, it's more and more realistic. But we want students to have a good attitude towards this. We want them to be confident, responsible, but being able to use technologies these include physical technologies such as a hammer or sewing machine or scissors through to creating websites and robots and uh, computer programs. They want to use, be able to use the various equipment and processes and materials, the data and the systems and all the various components that make up our solutions. And th at the end of all this, they need to then be able to analyze and evaluate has it met the needs of society or whoever it's been made for? Were there other opportunities that were missed that could be expanded upon and developed? And has the problem been solved? So needs, opportunities and problems allow us to create solutions. Okay, so that's a bit of a preamble. Now next week we're going to look at content in more detail but now we're going to go through some of the specific content um, in the technologies learning area. Basically, it's broken into two strands, knowledge and understanding and processes and production. So knowledge and understanding is what students need to know and understand about various things. Processes and production skills are them being able to do things with that knowledge. So the two are very much linked. One without the other, isn't very effective. We need to know about things and we need to be able to then do something with that knowledge. And those two things are taught in an integrated way throughout the technologies learning area. Okay, and at the end of all of this learning, Sally's students need to be assessed. So they've learned how to, all this knowledge about technologies, they've learned about how to do things and make things and created various solutions to problems. They've made a, a better bus stop system to enable students to get onto buses more quickly and safely and efficiently. Um, there can be a whole range of things that they have created. And they're not all physical things. A bus stop system isn't a physical uh, tool or device. It's a way of doing things. They may have created a better garden system or a watering device that every hour puts a certain amount of water on the plants. A whole range of different possible solutions that students would have worked through and done through technologies. But when we also have to assess them. Now we're going to be looking at assessment in detail at the end of this course. But for now, we need to know that there are a range of achievement standards of what is expected of students at various points in their learning journey. Um, and in technologies education, we generally assess every two years. We've got foundation, then years one and two, three and four, five and six for primary. Um, and that then informs what will be the bane of your life as a teacher and the bane of Sally's life is having to do report cards, um, actually report on students' progress. Now, it's very important. Parents want to know how students are going. Many students want to know how they're going. Some of them don't. Uh, but part of being a teacher is to be able to inform others on the progress of your students. Now, you're going to know your students. You're going to know how they're going. You don't have to rely upon assessment for that. Or you shouldn't have to. But we have a system in our education processes that involve assessment. Um, so you will need to assess them against criteria and you'll then need to report upon that. Now, that's done in different ways in different schools. Sometimes it's integrated with digital technologies and they're reported as a technologies learning area. Sometimes they're separate subjects. Sometimes as a STEM subject. Um, it's simply a matter, a process of letting parents and students know how they're going. Okay. 
So some of the core concepts of the learning area as a whole. We have some big ideas that we want students to understand. We've been talking through some of those. And these are central to the learning, to learning about technologies. Now, the big ideas are common to both subjects, both designer technology and digital technologies. And there are also some additional ones that are specific to those subjects. We have this circular map that describes how the core concepts are organized in technologies education. So all around and encompassing everything is creating solutions for preferred futures. We're going to explore futures thinking and preferred futures in a few weeks time, but we're trying to make the world better and the future better through the creation of solutions. Now to assist with that, students need to understand and have a deep understanding of data, systems and the interactions and impact of various technologies. These will unpack later. Assisting in that is students being enterprising and innovative, um, knowing in, de in depth the technologies, pr productions and processes and their project management skills being able to use those projects as a learning process and manage that effectively, be that in teams or individually, time management, there's a whole range of things around um, project management. Then we have our three big thinking skills, computational thinking, design thinking, and systems thinking. And then we have our two um, themes, uh, design and oh, sorry, two subjects, design and technologies and digital technologies. And to remind us and to keep it central is the creating of solutions. So that's just a graphical organizer of the digital, oh, sorry, of technologies as a learning area as a whole. So this pretty much says that again. <laughs> These are those. Um, big picture organizing structures with students creating solutions through that iterative approach of going through that design cycle um, where they can evaluate and collaborate and come up with new ideas and process different ways of doing things, build things, produce things. And we then have um, a series of what are called substrands. This is for the the whole learning area as a whole, investigating and defining, generating and designing, producing and implementing. And this is where we then focus on the three thinking skills, computational design and systems thinking. This won't make a huge amount of sense just yet. Stick with us. We're going to go through and explore how all of these things um, unpack in the various subjects. But just like Sally, you're probably feeling a bit overwhelmed at this stage. Unfortunately, it doesn't get much better quickly. Um, we're going to keep pressing forward and going through and exploring the technologies learning area as a whole, and then the subjects across curriculum areas and a few other elements as well. So stick with us. So creating solutions for preferred futures is the overarching concept and we want to take into account things such as diversity, ethics, economic and environmental and social sustainability, essentially making our students responsible for their actions, be that creating a technology product or using a technology or abusing a technology. Now, for the very young students, that's going to be things like um, making sure that they use passwords or not hitting their friend with a hammer, relatively simple direct concepts. But in the upper years of primary, we do start getting into some reasonably complex ethical decision-making processes. When is it right to download a song off the internet? What's the impact of that? Who does it harm? Is it ethical? These are things that you'll explore with your students. Sally had problems with this because sometimes she admits she was doing some of these things herself. Having to teach students not to do things when you are doing them is an ethical conundrum in itself, but it is part of being a teacher of technologies learning area. So 
these are some of the things that we'll explore as we go through the course. For now, before we get into our next section, take a bit of a break and then we'll come back and we'll go through the design and technology subject. Okay, so let's now look at the design and technology subject. As mentioned, the technologies learning area is broken into two subjects, design and technology and digital technologies. Now, design and technology is around preparing students to develop opportunities and address the challenges related to the world in terms of creating design solutions to those problems. Now, as we've been talking about, it's around giving the students the knowledge and capability to do so, but also the confidence and the encouragement to engage with those processes. And of course, we have the big picture aims and objectives of enriching and transforming society through creating through our natural managed and constructed environments. Now, those three elements are fairly important. We have the natural environment. We have the managed environment where we manage the natural environment and make changes to it and process it and all the rest. And then we have constructed environments, which are non-natural um, inside a boat or things of like that. So in terms of design technology, we want them to be creative and responsive designers, responding to the challenges of the world in creative ways. But we need to have them do so within a particular framework. So they need to be able to consider the ethical, legal, aesthetic, and functional factors of their design solutions and the impact that they will have on the economy, on the environment, and on society. So they need to be discerning decision makers. They're not just empowered to create, they're empowered to create in a discerning way to make the world a better place. Of course, the power to create can also be misused. And we want to make sure that our students don't do that. So, as we've talked about, um, it's about students creating design solutions. Solutions to the problem where they've designed that solution. Now, as part of that, they need to identify the need for a solution or the opportunity that may arise, arise between particular circumstances. Now, once that's done, they need to be able to then manage the process of coming up with that design solution. And that's where we teach our students how to manage projects, to work independently when necessary, but also to work collaboratively when necessary. We develop their leadership skills, their fellowship skills, how to work effectively in a team. These are all very important functions of the technologies process. And students need to be able to understand and articulate and actuate how to go from conceiving of an idea through to actually having it realized as a solution to a problem. And that's quite a complex process, particularly for young students who have never done anything of that nature before. So they apply their design and systems thinking, and we're going to explore the thinking skills in quite a bit of detail in a few weeks, to create design solutions by going through various processes of investigating, generating, evaluating, ideating. But essentially all that means they're improving their design ideas. They're going through a cyclical process to come up with their solution. And each time they go through that draft, it, begets, it becomes better and better. Now, this is probably one of the key aspects of technology's education is the idea that students will iteratively improve. And it's not something we do very well, but it's fundamental to all forms of creativity. Now, why do I say that? It's the, the problem is we have to embrace failure and we don't do that well at, in education. We're going to talk about this in a lot more detail in our pedagogy session. But students need to understand that their first time at doing something 
their first attempt at a solution, will invariably have problems. It won't be perfect. And often it will completely fail. But they will learn from that and they will use that as an opportunity to then improve. So students plan and produce their design solutions. They make things. That's another fundamental aspect of technologies and design and technology. Students have to be actually producing something. Now, it doesn't have to be necessarily physical. It can be a process or a system or an environment. They might uh, make a farm or a vegetable garden, or they might make an idea, uh, a better way of conducting a sports carnival so that things are more efficiently done and records are kept and can work out the scores more effectively. There can be a whole range of different solutions, but there is a design process involved in creating those solutions. It's not an artistic process. It's not a scientific process where we're trying to understand scientific principles. It's an engineering process where we're working through to create a solution to a problem through some form of designed artifact, be it physical or process-based. And in doing that, students will develop a sense of pride and satisfaction and enjoyment. Technology's education can be a really great subject for students because it's practical, hands-on. They can see the objective of what they're trying to achieve quite clearly. And they often enjoy the context and the processes involved in making things. A lot of their games and um, leisure activities are based around very similar ideas. Making a cake, building with Lego, these are things that we take to a much higher level in design and technology, but they're still fundamentally a, a common aspect of their traditional play-based activities. So taking that into a school environment, into a classroom environment, often provides a, a level of familiarity for students that they can engage with and enjoy over more traditional academic pursuits. Okay, so, and as I talked about, <coughs> the solutions that students create aren't just products, aren't just physical things. They can also be services, ways of helping others, doing things, performing a service to the community, to their friends, to their family, to themselves, and also environments, built environments, created environments, uh, modified environments, or even just the natural environment. How to not impact an environment can be a design solution. So in doing all of this, we want to have what's called authentic learning challenges. And we call these design challenges. And they're aimed at fostering students' curiosity, their confidence, their persistence, and overcoming failure and working through the problem to gain a solution, their innovation and creativity, their respect for one another, for their tools, for their environment, for the challenge itself, and their cooperation where they can't always do it all on their own and they need to work with others in order to address complex, difficult problems. And many of these skills will then be transferable to other contexts, uh, be it in their own home, in their family life, in their, their friends, um, their leisure activities, what they do in the community or eventually in their field of work. So there are a number of key things that we want to ensure that students in studying design and technology come out with at the end. Well, it's actually progressive. Every, every band, every two years, as they progress through the curriculum, they will develop these skills and they will iteratively improve upon them. So first off, students need to be um, confident and critical users of technologies and designers and producers of design solutions. We've talked a bit about that already. They need to go through the design cycle, the design process to come up with their solutions, investigating, generating, iterating, analyzing, looking at the ethical and innovative possible solutions towards creating a sustained future. They need to use design and systems thinking to generate their design ideas and to communicate these ideas to a range of audiences, to their teachers, to their peers, potentially to clients where students work with people that are going to actually use or have the solution designed for them. You could imagine that might be in a nursing home or it might be the local bakery 
or it might be the community um, garden, and the students are coming up with a solution, an improvement, a change, a modification, whatever, for particular clients. And they need to be then able to talk about their design ideas, provide alternatives, provide options, find out what the clients want. Um, and this is all an important process that young students need to go through in learning about the design cycle and design processes. So we need to always remember that the solution needs to actually solve the problem. Too often in education, we come up with solutions. We come up with products that students create, often very academically. It's, a, it's for the assignment. Um, we made it because the teacher said we had to make it. It doesn't really have a real world context that's being made for actual people or actual um, circumstances that make sense for them and also for a real world application of their solutions. So they'll need to do that, use a range of technologies. Uh, they need to manipulate a whole range of tools. They need to learn how to use those tools, be it a programming language, particularly with um, digital technologies, or being simple tools like how to use a knife, how to use a pair of scissors, how to use a glue gun. There's a whole range of different tools that we'll need to teach students so that they can effectively understand what those tools can do and what they can do with those tools and how that then opens up a range of different possible solutions to the problems that they're trying to address through using those tools. Now, some of these approaches to using tools are done um, not so much in a design cycle way, but as activities in learning how to actually physically use the tools. Um, and again, we'll talk more about those different approaches when we address the pedagogies. But students will also need to use various equipment. It might be a 3D printer. It might be a um, various gardening tools. Um, how to use an oven, how to use a hot plate. Um, a whole range of different tools that students will need to learn about and equipment that they'll need to learn about. How we can use different types of glues. Um, different types of um, soils in a gardening context. Um, these are all equipment and materials that they need to understand. And they need then to understand the systems that are involved. Um, a garden is a complex system involving water and soil and um, light and air and sunshine, and, um, rain, and then the seeds and the, the um, pests. These all form a complex system that students need to learn about and understand in order to effectively cultivate um, plants. So they need to be able to then know enough about these things so that they can creatively come up with different ways of using them and doing things in different systems and all the rest as part of their design solutions. And they can then confidently do that and safely do that. Once that's all done, they need to be able to make some sort of measure of how successful they've been. And through this, we use the term evaluation. So they need to be able to evaluate various stages of their progress, how their teams are working, how they're keeping to timelines, how different solutions are um, coming together. Um, and then the final product or the final solution, they are how does it, does it meet the client's needs? Does it meet the solution as the teacher described it would be, or how they described what they wanted the solution to be. They also need to understand the roles and responsibilities of people in these various processes. If they need equipment or tools or assistance, how are they going to go about negotiating that? How will they get assistance to do things? If they need fertilizer brought in and, and spread over their garden, Who's going to do that? How are they going to organize that? How's that going to be sorted? If they have, are designing a system to um, say work a better transport system for bus drop-offs, are they going to have to talk to and negotiate and understand how the bus drivers do their job or how parents are um, negotiating the drop-off process or how the, the safety um, people with the, the lollipops um, directing traffic, how they do their job. 
these are all things that the students would need to interrogate and learn about and understand in order to come up with a better solution to the problem of um, transport to and from school uh, drop-off points. So that gives an overview of what students need to learn. Now we need to go into more specifics of that learning. And we call this the content of the curriculum. Now in design and technology, it's, it's organized under two related strands, knowledge and understanding and process and production skills. Same as digital technologies actually. And it's the overall content um, strands of the technologies learning area. But essentially knowledge and understanding as we've discussed before is their understanding of what's involved in the theory and concepts related to design and technology, how to use various tools and equipment and materials, how they can develop various solutions, such as joining two pieces of wood together, different ways of doing that, um, how they can then understand the impact of those technologies through various scenarios and understanding um, recycling, the, um, the negative impact of various materials if they're put into waste or if they're put into the oceans and things of that nature. And then we've also got the processes and production skills, which is that design cycle, which we'll be exploring um, in quite a bit of detail. OK, so within those two strands, students will then safely and ethically design, plan, manage, produce and evaluate product services and environments. Um, but they don't do them in separation. Very much everything is integrated and balanced throughout the technologies learning area and design and technology specifically as we're discussing it now. So you won't just do the design process on its own. It needs a context. It needs some sort of knowledge and understanding about various tools and materials and ideas that they can then frame their design processes around to develop solutions. Um, and those contexts um, are specified for a design and technology. And we're going to go through and look at what those uh, are in a moment. So knowledge and understanding has five substrands, um, or up to five substrands. Some of the younger years have fewer substrands. Um, technologies in society is one that's common to all of them. Um, we want all of our students at all year levels to understand the impact that technology has on society. So even in our various younger, younger students, it may be how the technology might have an impact upon them. Um, if they do something wrong, it might cut them um, or they might burn themselves. So it's related specifically to them. In older years, towards the upper primary, we're then starting to look at how the technologies might have an impact upon society or the environment, much broader impacts. And then we have four other substrands. Um, processes and production also has five substrands, which are the five steps of the design cycle. Um, in foundation and years one and two, um, we, we condense those into um, collective strands, and we'll talk about that as we go through them. Now, all of these substrands are designed to be organizers. They're not designed to be done individually or separately. They all form a mix of um, elements that are part of any designer technology learning activity. And this is where a project-based approach to design technology really comes to its fore. Of course, it naturally integrates all of these elements together around students developing solutions to problems through a project. Um, if you try to teach them individually, like try to teach evaluation as a single thing, and then try to teach design as a single thing, it doesn't work. Uh, it's theoretically possible, but it would just be such a pain and so disinteresting for students that no one does it that way. So sometimes we do have specific focus lessons around particular concepts and ideas and, and substrands, but they're generally always done within a larger context of all of these strands contributing to a design process towards developing a solution to a problem. Now, as a teacher, you'll make decisions as to how much time to spend on these various um, elements. And 
it will re be related to the needs of your students. If your students have done lots of designs before and are really good at doing designs and can do them really quickly, then you may spend very little time on that. If it's the first time students are really coming to a problem that involves a certain process of design, let's say designing a new um, ice cream, a new type of ice cream in terms of different flavorings and con um, consistency and all the rest, then students might need to spend a lot more time on design and relatively little time on actual production and evaluation. Whereas if students have done, um, say, if you're doing a bridge building activity and they've done many bridge building activities before, they might quickly go through the design process because they're quite confident in what they want their design to be and focus then more on the materials and the manufacturing processes of the um, development stage of the design cycle, the creation process. So knowledge and understanding. Now, this, as I've mentioned, is all of the underpinning knowledge that students need to know about how to use the tools, how to use the equipment, the processes, the material systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the contexts provide a framework for, in which students engage with those. So one of the contexts, um, say, looking at uh, architecture might be a context. And we'll then look at then knowledge and understanding around different forms of architecture uh, from the very simple ones of building a lean-to to a tent to a, a very simple building through to more complex architecture such as a high-rise building or the Sydney Opera House or something like that. Um, so the context provides a framework around which we explore various knowledge and understanding about materials and systems and processes and equipment and so forth. Okay, so within knowledge and understanding, we have five substrands, technology and society, engineering principles and systems, food and fiber production, food specializations, and materials technology specializations. And in foundation, we have an, um, a separate one called designing and making. We, we simplify things a lot for the foundation years. And indeed for um, other years, we also combine some of these, and I'll talk about that in a sec. So technology and society goes across all of them. Um, we want students to understand about the potential impacts that their solutions will have, but also how technologies impact upon them. Engineering principles and systems looks at um, fundamental forces and energies involved in um, design solutions such as chemical, mechanical, friction, um, electromagnetic, electrostatic, and gravitation. So these things are very much related to science, and often we teach them as we're teaching science concepts. So how to actually have something move? We can put wheels on it. That causes, has some friction. So as we um, push a little toy cart along a path, it slows down and stops. From a science perspective, we want to understand the concepts of friction in terms of um, the scientific processes involved. From an engineering perspective, from a design and technology perspective, we want to look at how to solve a problem related to friction, which might be how to have the car go the furthest distance with the least amount of energy. So very different um, outcomes, but understandings of the concepts are the same. So that's why they're often taught together. So from a design technology perspective, we'd be looking at how we can uh, maybe use different types of wheels or different types of surfaces or different sizes of wheels and how they all relate to friction in order to have the solution being the furthest distance um, traversed by the vehicle. From a science perspective, it's about learning the concept of friction and how it works and, um, and all of those related elements. So we'll often do similar things. We'll maybe do some electronics in design technology, building a little um, a doll's house with um, lights that turn on and off and maybe a little fan with a motor. Now, from a design and technology perspective, we want to actually have that work. We want to know that when we flip the switch, the lights come on, flip another switch, the um, fan turns on and off. From a science perspective, we want to know about the electrons moving around the wires and how the battery um, provides the energy for that Again, same activity, 
different learning outcomes. So engineering principles and systems of, offer opportunities for students to make sense of scientific and mathematical concepts um, and use those concepts, use their understanding of science and maths in an applied way to actually solve problems, to make solutions to problems that utilize that knowledge of science and mathematics. Um, and through all of that, of course, we need to understand the potential impacts on the environment, on resource usage. Um, if we have our solution use wheels that are 10 meters high, that's going to be much more expensive, much more environmentally impactful, cause much deeper rivets in the road than wheels that are 30 centimeters high. Might have much less friction, but the impact upon the environment or upon systems or on costs and all the rest might be prohibitive. The next one is food and fiber production. Now this is looking at how we harvest um, resources to sustain us. Um, farms, gardens, plantations, uh, fish farms, all of these um, processes whereby we gather food and fibers for our clothing, for our various other products, um, we need to teach students about this. Now, there's a lot of reasons for doing that. Um, in Australia, we're blessed with uh, an abundance of food and fibre, uh, but it's an important element of our economy. Many countries, they have, a, have limitations on that. They have famines. People die because they don't have enough food. Um, so we need to understand how to, where food comes from, um, how to make it more effective and efficient in terms of producing food, um, the cycles involved in getting food to the plate, we call that um, farm, uh, farm to the plate or something like that, <laughs> I'll remember it later. Um, but there are various processes around um, the food production cycle that we need students to understand, that it doesn't just come to the supermarket or come to the pantry at home, that there are production cycles um, transportation, um, food preservation, food, um, uh, different processes conducted on food um, to preserve it so that it lasts a long time, to make sure it's healthy um, and safe for us to eat. All of these things can be explored in food and fiber production. Um, and students should explore those as part of design challenges, how to actually improve those processes how to make an ice cream so that it doesn't drip on a hot day or doesn't drip as much. Um, how to create a lunchbox that will keep their food safe from ants um, and keep the their sandwiches nice and fresh so that they can eat them at lunchtime um, like they were would if they were freshly made at home. These are things that students can explore and come up with design solutions to them. They could look at the tuck shop system, um, create an ordering system so that the students can order their, um, their lunches and have them delivered to their classroom so that they can quickly eat their lunches and have more free time for play. These are all systems and processes related to food and fiber production. How to use layers versus thick um, overgarments um, and the advantages and disadvantages of, of those and exploring which is better for um, use so that when they go out and play, they can take off a layer at a time um, and adjust to the temperature changes or design a, designing a better hat so that it keeps them more protected from the sun. Lots of different things that can be explored in food and fiber production. And then we have food specializations. Now, this is related very much to health, health and PE um, uh, learning area. And it relates very much to the preparation and the nutritional value of food, how we can make better selections of food so that we have a better diet, how that we can prepare food in different ways so it's more palatable, um, so that we will be happy to eat our vegetables. Of course, they've been nicely prepared and they taste nice and everything else. Um, so there's lots of things that can be done around that and also looking at this, how to do it in a sustainable way. Um, how to make choices. Is it sustainable to always eat at fast food restaurants or 
um, at high class restaurants. The food quality might be much better at high class restaurants, but it may cost a lot more. That may not be sustainable. Eating at fast food restaurants may be much cheaper, but it may not be particularly nutritional and it may lead to becoming overweight. And that may not be sustainable in terms of health outcomes. So there's many different things we can explore around uh, food specializations. And students really delve into this and it's really about them making better decisions in their um, healthy eating programs. Okay, and the final one is materials and technology specializations. Now, this is looking at design product services and environments um, for specific um, uses, be that for communication, housing, employment, healthcare, recreation, or transport, and understanding those processes, how materials and different technologies are used for communication, for housing, for employment, for healthcare, for recreation, designing a better playground or a skate park, designing a better bus or train system, um, a communication system, um, maybe a loudspeaker system for, for around the school, um, or designing a house, or a homeless shelter, or a, a better sleeping bag. These are all things that could be explored around materials and technology specializations. So, Again, students need to explore um, these approaches and the different materials and components and processes that will be involved in them. Oops. Okay, so in this, we often break them down into various disciplines, be that architecture or advanced manufacturing, um, electronics, Fashion design, it's a popular one, making different um, clothing items. Um, sometimes we use um, found materials such as garbage bags to make wedding dresses um, or designing a new T-shirt or, as I mentioned before, a hat. Um, but there's also service design and product design around different infrastructure and leisure activities or even textile design, how to make a better uh, wo a weave for a jumper or... Um, things of that nature. So there's lots and lots of different things and contexts that we can incorporate in our exploration of materials and technologies. So to do all of that, now that we have the knowledge and understanding of all of these different um, elements, we need the processes and production skills to actually work through and create those design solutions. Oops. Again, these are organized into five strands, investigating and defining, generating and designing, evaluating and implementing, sorry, producing and implementing, evaluating and collaborating and managing. So investigating and designing involves students working out what the needs are. Is there actually a need for a solution? Sometimes there's not. It might just be an opportunity. It might be an opportunity to make money. There's not necessarily a need to make money, but there might be an opportunity to make money through development of a product or a service or a solution. Um, and, but often this will involve actually talking to potential, um, to those people that will be impacted by their solutions, um, finding out what they want the solution to be, finding out what they think is important around that solution. Um, so they'll need to analyze and examine their own, the values and the questions. Um, whoops, I jumped ahead, haven't I? Okay, so essentially they need to reflect upon, um, is it right to create this solution? Um, is it going to use up too many resources? Is it going to be environmentally impactful? Is it going to actually be the best solution to the problem? Is it going to cost more? Is it going to cause other issues? Um, so these are things they need to consider in their investigating and defining um, stage. And they need to then also, one of the issues a lot of students have difficulty with is actually defining the problem that they're going to solve. Um, too often in education, we give students the problem and that asks them to find a solution to that problem. And essentially what we want them to find 
the solution that we're thinking of. Um, in technologies education, it's never as cut and dried as that. There are always many different solutions to a problem. And getting students to understand that can be difficult because we've trained them to find the problem or sorry, the solution to the problem that we want them to find. So untraining them around that does take a bit of work. But for that, we want students to come up with a range of different solutions. The part of that is around defining that problem. We want them to define the problem in such a way that it is that it permits multiple solutions. Um, and if you are setting the problem for them, you should try to do the same. Now, in design technology, in the past, we've had an issue whereby teachers have often given students an act, what's called a design and technology activity, which is essentially stepping students through a recipe. Um, we're going to make this birdhouse. Uh, you're all going to cut out the pieces of wood as I've, I've described them using this template. I'm now going to throw, take you through and you're going to hammer these specific nails and you're all going to make the exact same birdhouse just as the one I've got here to demonstrate to you. And everyone will end up with that same birdhouse. Now, in terms of teaching them how to use a hammer or how to use glue and, and do some skills, that might be okay. But it is not a process as a production cycle. Their students are not involved in any design aspect. Now, and it's also very difficult for them to evaluate it because they've all created exactly the same thing. They could evaluate the teacher's design. But, um, so you really have to ensure that you allow students some freedom to actually be involved in the process, to actually do some designing, to make some decisions. And that's hard for some teachers, but it is really essential because students can't be creative. They can't achieve all of those things that we're talking about in terms of the aims of design and technology or technologies learning as a whole without being able to be involved in those design processes. So once they've worked out what the problem is and ideally had some say in deciding what that problem is, then we move to coming up with as many different solutions to that problem as possible. Um, the idea of this is so that then they can make some decisions around which is the best solution to the problem. If they only come up with one and then implement it and so forth, it may work, it may not work, then they've got to come back through that whole cycle again. This allows them to come up with a range of different solutions and evaluate them and go through that iterative cycle while they're still in the designing stage of the cycle. Um, so they'll make some choices, weigh up options, consider alternatives, document it, come up with designs. You may be involved at various stages. You may involve other students as peer evaluations. You may, may bring out in external experts to look at their designs and help them make decisions as to which ones to progress. It may be the clients that make the final decision. There can be a range of ways of helping students with that designing process and generating ideas. Um, they'll use their critical and uh, or it'll develop their critical and creative thinking um, by going through this generative process. And they'll consider a whole range of factors. And some of these factors will be competing. Um, the amount of materials it uses, the amount of time it's going to take to produce, um, how effective it will be in terms of the solution. Often these are trade-offs that students will need to make. And that's an important skill in itself. If you've given them only a set design that they have to follow through, then they don't have any opportunity to engage with any of those processes. And students will often represent their designs using various tools and techniques, uh, creating sketches and drawings, creating little models, um, potentially even computer-aided models or simulations that demonstrate their design. And communicating that can also be a, an important aspect of the design process. Then we move into the producing and implementing stage where they're going to actually produce or implement their solution. Um, this is probably the least important stage. If they've come up with a great design and they've developed um, all of that properly, actually producing it should be relatively trivial. 
it's important around certain skills and so forth, but in terms of the processes and production, it's the least creative um, stage. But it is important because students want to see the product of their um, solution. And particularly if it's being made for a real world problem, um, clients certainly want to see a solution that they can then implement. Um, students in creating their solution will learn about how to do so safely um, and also efficiently and effectively. Creating a solution that takes three weeks when it could have taken two days is not the best. Um, and we'll often design tasks and give constraints around tasks in terms of how much time students have to spend on an activity. Mostly because we only have so much time and there's so much to cover in the curriculum. But that provides an important framework that students need to work within. And it's a difficult one for young students. Um, they can't necessarily measure and understand how long a process is going to take or are necessarily even interested in that. So we need to build that into the process, build that, and we'll talk about that in a second, about the management of those processes. That they'll also need to select the tools that they're going to use, the materials, the processes, the teamwork structures, all the rest of the things that will be involved in creating their solutions. Um, sometimes we'll only have them create a, it's called a prototype solution, enough of a solution to demonstrate what might happen if we actually made it either full scale or using all the proper materials. We might make a um, it out of cardboard instead of out of plastic or metal. Um, we might make it at a smaller scale. We might make a house out of a in, in a small scale. We might make it out of Lego instead of other materials. But it's enough then to demonstrate the idea and the design um, and how it could be a fully working solution. Then we have the evaluation stage. And I often talk about this as evaluation and testing. Um, in order to evaluate, you really do need to make some form of measurement. And to do a measurement, you have to test. Um, and this is important because we need to think about evaluation and testing when we do our designs. Of course, if we leave it till the end, it's often too late to be able to build in testing processes, uh, particularly if we want to do what's called a pre-post test. We want to measure how, how something was happening beforehand and then how something is happening after we put in place our solution to then see if there's been any change and any improvement, or indeed things might have got worse. But unless we've done some sort of testing beforehand, we can't then test afterwards and then make a comparison. So that's why thinking about our evaluation and testing processes as we do our design is an important aspect. But again, young children have never gone through the design cycle or have only done it a few times. So they can't necessarily see that big picture process. So you'll need to build in processes for getting them to test and evaluate um, before and after so that they can do proper evaluation of their solutions. But there are other ways of evaluating, such as peer evaluation. Um, you can do it as a teacher, as a pseudo expert evaluating their work. You can bring in experts and have them evaluate. You could bring in the clients, have them evaluate. You could put the, their solution into practice and evaluate how it actually works in the real world. There's a range of different ways that we can evaluate student solutions, but we need some form of criteria against which to measure this, um, the success or failure of their solutions. And we have to accept that it might fail. So an evaluation needs to be honest. Um, it can't just be um, positive feedback. Sure, positive feedback has its place, but sometimes we have to give um, negative feedback so that students can then learn from that and then adjust their designs, either in a cyclical process for this particular um, design challenge or in future when they come to do another design challenge. If they are not given authentic feedback, then they'll simply make the same mistakes again. Of course, they won't know that they have done so ineffectively. Okay, and ideally, students will be involved in working out the best ways of testing and judging and improving their ideas. Um, for younger ch children, 
they need more support around that. They need to learn how to test, how to judge, how to make improvements. But as they master those, and they need to do and develop that, we give more responsibility to students in being able to make their own choices around evaluations. Okay, then we also have the collaborating and managing. So the design process is done by someone. Um, and we need to be able to then look at that and teach students how to actually do it. Um, often we have group work and group assignments and group activities, but we don't teach students how to actually collaborate, how to work in teams. We often give projects, but we don't teach students how to manage projects. Time management, process management, resource management are all complex, difficult tasks. We pay people in society big money to be managers and leaders, but we don't necessarily teach our students how to do any of these things and we trivialize them in classroom contexts. So it's important that we actually teach students not only how to collaborate and work together and um, move through processes, but also how to manage these processes. And we'll talk a bit this um, when we look at the thinking skills around a concept called strategic thinking um, or an entrepreneurial thinking and a range of other high water thinking skills that touch on uh, collaboration and management. But essentially, you need to teach your students and give them opportunities to practice and learn these elements. They are part of the curriculum. They are not things that we can simply assume or to let students naturally express their capabilities. We need to teach them explicitly how to work together and how to manage projects. Okay, so once they've got these skills, they then work individually or in groups. They plan and organize and monitor their timelines, their activities, their use of resources. Often we put caps on the amount of resources they have. It may be the physical caps. You've only got these number of toothpicks to make this particular construction. Or we might incorporate budgetary processes whereby students can purchase how many paddle pop sticks or toothpicks or how much glue, and they can then work out a budget um, in order to develop their solutions and go through those processes. So lots of opportunities to learn from the collaborating and managing, management elements of the design cycle. Okay, so with all of those knowledge and understandings and processes and production skills, we then have the context around which students create their solutions, their design solutions. And they can be either products, services, or environments. And we then, well, so their solutions can be the product, services, and environments, and they can be then applied in various contexts. So there's lots of different contexts, touched on a few of them already. It might be around architecture or fashion or food production or gardening, many different contexts that we can um, address. And in the curriculum, there are specific contexts for different age groups in design and technology. Digital technology doesn't specify them as tightly. Design and technology does so. So in foundation, students will develop at least one design solution um, during their foundation year. And in years one to six, they should have opportunities to produce at least, um, well, all three of those types of solutions, products, um, services, and environments. Um, in their two-year bands. So by the end of foundation, students should have produced at least one type of design solution for one of the technologies context or one that you've identified by the school. Um, pretty much you can choose whatever you want to do for the foundation, but they have to have developed at least one design solution in their foundation year. In years one and two, we combined the context of engineering principles and systems and materials and technology specializations together. And we also combine food and fire production and food specialization together. In reality, it's just labeling. Um, they're still doing all four contexts, just we've combined, combined them into two contexts. Um, but by the end of um, the two year band, they should have created three different types of design solutions 
and addressed each of those two contexts. So they don't have to address all four, but they do have to address one that's in engineering and materials specializations and one in food, food and fire production food specializations. So at least, well, essentially they have to have done three projects. Of course, they've got it, they have to have done three design solutions over that two year band. And they have to have done at least one in each of the two um, sets of engineering set or food and fiber sets. Now, of course, many schools and teachers will cover many more projects than just um, three in a two year band. Um, some do them that do one per term. Um, depends upon how much time has been allocated for the technologies learning area. We'll talk about that again in a few weeks. Um, but in years three and four, it's essentially the same. Uh, again, three design solutions in the two combined bands. And years five and six, we split apart the engineering ones. So you need to do, again, three design solutions at a minimum in the three, band, uh, the three types of contexts. So it just starts getting a little bit more specific as we go up in the year levels. Okay, so in, technology, in design and technology, we have some core concepts, just like in the overall technologies learning area, we have some core concepts. In the subjects, we also have core concepts. And they're specific to design technologies. We have the engineering, essentially they're the, what we were previously calling the contexts. Uh, now we're calling them concepts. So in engineering principles and systems, we want students to understand um, the, the mathematics and scientific principles involved in various engineering um, processes. Materials, again, we need to students understand the characteristics and properties of these various materials. Food and fiber, they need to understand um, that uh, farm to the plate sort of processes where we actually get food and fiber from and that it doesn't all come from supermarkets and things like that. It can also explore packaging and all those different elements. And, and then food specializations is focused around the big picture concepts around making good choices around food preparation and selection. Okay, so take another break and then we'll come back and we'll explore the digital technology subject area. So digital technologies is the second subject in the technologies learning area. And as its name implies, it focuses on those technologies that are more recent as a result of the computer revolution, the internet and associated modern technologies. Now, likewise with the technologies learning area, it is focused on empowering our students to engage with the opportunities these new technologies present, but also the challenges that they represent. In the course website, I've provided you with some activity to look at the challenges of artificial intelligence. Um, that is going to have a big place in all of our lives over the next coming decades as it replaces many existing jobs and indeed potentially all jobs. So there's a little tool there that you can utilize to see the threats to various jobs that artificial intelligence currently has. Um, I actually do research myself in the field of artificial intelligence and teaching. I use a robot that teaches some of my courses. Um, in particular to show students that some aspects of teaching can be automated relatively easily and digital presentations presenting information um, is relatively simple to accomplish the image you're looking at now could quite easily be an avatar generated by a computer and potentially being powered by an ai deciding what to say and how to engage with you and indeed, I've got a robot that has two legs and two arms and looks like a small human being that has actually taught this course. 
um, presenting lectures. So artificial intelligence is having a place within education at the moment, and it will continue to have that place as it becomes a tool that we utilize to analyze students' performance, to interpret their um, essays and assessment tasks and provide feedback to them, all the way through to tools that will help us craft better lesson plans and conduct lessons and conduct instruction through guided, personalized individual processes. Just one of the many, many challenges that are facing us over the next coming decades. Genetic engineering is going to be another one, but we have smart drugs already impacting upon student performance. How that's going to play out when parents can genetically engineer their children for different traits and characteristics. Um, how you will have some students with super intelligence in your class and some with not so super intelligence. <laughs> so these are going to be things that society will come to grips with over the next, um, well, certainly few decades. We have a shift potentially towards virtual worlds where social media has been a dominant player in the last um, decade or so. A shift into the metaverse and 3D virtual avatars moving around um, 3D spaces may become the norm and how that will impact upon education. So lots of challenges that are going to be in place for our students and indeed ourselves. Many jobs will be replaced. Automatic vehicles are going to replace a whole slew of them. Automatic um, computerized interactions at the shop face are already changing the nature of consumer interactions. We're now, many of our supermarkets, we purchase through scanners and computers, and that will be replaced in the next um, probably few years with automatic tracking of, of um, produce so that you do, you'll just pick up stuff and leave the store and it will automatically debit your card without you having to go through any checkout process. That's already being trialed in some stores. So massive changes happen. And digital technologies is predominantly about preparing students for those. Not just so that they understand what's happening, though that's a big part of it, but so that they can actually take some proactive action about these changes so that they can craft the future as we want it or they want to see it happen rather than just have it happen to us. So having that autonomy and that agency is a big part of digital technologies. And of course, we want students to be accountable. Not all students, not everyone is um, ethically minded. And sometimes we challenge some things around our ethics in the use of computing and the internet and so forth. Downloading music um, is something that is ethically questionable. Um, is it right to do so? Is it right to download movies or TV shows or lesson plans or other material on the internet? When is it okay to do things with digital technologies? And when is it not okay? And what are the risks involved? How do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our identity? We talked about you seeing me now and whether or not I'm an actual real human avatar. I might not be. It's relatively easy to manipulate images. Actors are very concerned about this. Um, we're already seeing actors being replaced by avatar computer generated imagery, but that's going to intensify password protection identity protection. These are all things that are important aspects of digital technologies. But it's not just learning about them. It's being able to create them. That's the key driver for the digital technology subject. Being able to actually make these things, being the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the creators of digital technologies. We haven't been fantastic at that. And that's what the future challenges us. Of course, if many of our jobs are now going to move to that space, we have to prepare our students to be able to engage proactively there, to find employment, to find their, their place in society. Many, many years ago, online dating was looked at with great derision and um, a lot of laughter whenever we talked about it in these courses. 
Now it's the norm. That is changing society. Our social structures, how we interact with one another. Students need to understand this, not just at an applied level, but at a level where they can actually create new ways of interacting, at a technological level, being able to create the technologies that drive many of these changes. So, we want to be able to enable our students to transform opportunities that they have and address what's what we call the reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle process to make things more efficient and effective and look for the opportunities that technology provides us. Oops. So digital systems support new ways of collaborating and communicating. We're using one such process now, whereas in the past you would have had to all attend a lecture theatre and I would present it live. Now we have digital technologies that are um, providing us different ways of doing that, but also communicating. In the recent pandemic, we also had many different new challenges around communicating and working effectively in a digitally enhanced environment. That we're still essentially problem solving. All of this relates to solving problems, but the tools in this case we now have are data, processes, and digital tools and technologies that enable us to manipulate these. So we want to empower our students to shape change, not just to be able to cope with change, but actually shape it and direct the changes that are going to be occurring. But this is a big ask, but it is our current and future needs. Employment is going to be definitely related to this, Many of our social processes are going to be related to it. Education is going to be related to it. How you teach in 20 years time or 10 years time is going to be dramatically different to how you teach now. We're preparing you for a world as it currently is. We need to prepare our students for a world as it will be in 10 and 20 years time. And that involves pre preparing them with a range of fundamental coping and technological skills. So they need to have a deep understanding and knowledge of how computers work, how information works, how data works. And this will enable them to be able to make safe, respectful, creative, discerning decisions and make that preferred future that we want them to be able to be empowered to do so. This is going to be the big challenge of the 21st century. Will we be replaced by technology? Will we be regulated to a subordinate role? Or are we going to be able to maintain our control and leadership in this space? The question is still quite open. But one thing is certain, we have to have students that know about this to be able to have any hope of driving these processes. Okay, so in digital technologies, we provide students with practical opportunities to use design thinking and a range of other thinking skills to create innovative digital solutions. Now, within that, we have to recognize that we are dealing with a diversity of learners and we want to ensure that all of our students can participate in using and creating with digital technologies by enabling them to be innovative creators of digital solutions and effective users of existing solutions or digital systems, they will hopefully be critical consumers of information. As we've seen in recent years, there are ways of manipulating large populations through the use of social media and other digital technologies. That is only going to continue the power of digital technologies, the power of social media and other database driven information systems is extreme. Far more so than we've ever had the capability of doing so in the past. Coupled with AI systems and widespread data collection, these systems are going to be able to control and influence us in ways 
we still currently don't understand. And we need to prepare our students again for that world as best we can. OK, so within digital technologies, we give students opportunities for authentic learning challenges, just as we do in design and technology, that foster curiosity, confidence, persistence, innovation, creativity, respect and cooperation. You've probably heard that before. It's the same in both subjects. We want students to be able to make sense of complex ideas. And this starts getting a little bit more applied in digital technologies. Design and technology, generally we can have students understand most of the systems that they are engaged with. Some systems, some mechanical and um, electronic systems are probably a little bit beyond them still. But in the main, we've had lots of good examples and activities that we can have them work through. In digital technologies, it starts getting more complex. Big data, AI systems, these are things that are hard to understand, even for adults in the field. So having young children understand it is a challenge. Having them understand how robots work, how computer, computers work, how social media works. These are things many adults don't know. Many of you may not know. So we need to think about how we're going to guide our students in coping with these changes that are coming and indeed are already upon us. But they need to do so in a way that's safe, respectful, creative, innovative, and active ethical citizens capable of making informed decisions and being active members in our communities. So to do this, we have a range of um, things that we want to have students achieve in terms of the knowledge and understanding that they have. So they need to be able to use design thinking which we've already covered, to design, create, manage, and evaluate sustainable, innovative digital solutions. But they also need to be able to use another thinking skill that we're going to be exploring quite a bit in this subject called computational thinking. Now, computational thinking is quite a complex concept, and it's not fully defined yet. There are different ways of understanding computational thinking. Within the Australian curriculum, it's predominantly defined as a set of skills that students develop. These include the ability to abstract, um, to collect data and represent data and interpret data in different ways, to specify um, solutions, to use algorithms to automate processes, and to implement these algorithms in ways that um, can change data and change interactions in order to create solutions, digital solutions to various problems. Now, these are, I know these are many new terms that we're just starting to explore and they'll be unpacked as we go through the course. So all up again, we wanna make sure our students are confident in using digital systems efficiently and effectively to automate the transformation of data into information and creatively communicate ideas in a range of settings. A big part of digital technologies is focused around data data and information. That is really what has driven the technological innovation that we've seen in the last 20 years. It hasn't necessarily been the computers and the computing power. That certainly enabled things, but it's really been how we've used information and data. Social media is a good example of that. Social media is essentially just a very simple database. Facebook was created over a couple of weeks by a university student. Mark Zuckerberg, and it was designed to enable his friends to rate the girls in his college dorm. Pretty simple little database. You could do it on pencil and paper. He decided to do it on a computer. And he utilized one of the powers of computational thinking called abstraction to make it generalizable. Now, what generalizable achieved was that it could be used not just for rating the girls in his college dorm, but it could be used for rating the girls in any college dorm. And then they started realizing, okay, it could be used for rating girls, but it could also be used for some other things, such as making comments initially about those girls. But then they worked out, okay, maybe it could be just used for making comments about anything. So people could share snippets of information and other people could comment on those. And it burgeoned into what we now know as Facebook or very much as what has come to define social media, or at least one aspect of social media. Again, a very simple digital solution, 
for initially a very simple problem. But because of abstraction and generalizability, it was then able to be a, become quite a dominant force in today's society. Google was very similar. It was initially just a database of search terms. Again, it was on one small computer. Indeed, it was held together with Lego. It was a very simple solution to a problem. Uh, people wanted to search through sets of websites. Um, so they gathered various specific keywords and linked them to website addresses. So people could search for those keywords and it would give them a link off to that um, website. Of course, it's expanded and become much, much larger now. And it's come to dominate how we actually access information. Again, created over a weekend by some college students in a garage, as many technological innovations seem to be occurring. So a few other things. Students also need to be able to apply protocols and legal practices that support ethical collection and generation of data. Some of these things we've learned as a result of some of these innovations in social media and search engines, that they have a lot of power. So we need to think about, OK, how can that power be abused? How can we uh, protect what is used by these systems in terms of our own data? And how can we set up systems so that other people can't get access to things that we want to keep protected? And we want students to be able to apply systems thinking, another thinking skill that we're going to be exploring in detail in this course. And they use that to monitor, analyze, predict, and shape the interactions happening within information systems and computer systems with the individuals, societies, economies, and environments that are all part of what will what you'll come to understand of as systems thinking. Uh, but we won't go too much into that just yet. Then, of course, we also have design thinking, which we predominantly develop in design and, and technologies. But we also apply the design cycle in developing solutions in digital technologies. And it's exactly the same cycle. They go through designing, creating, managing, and evaluating that instead of creating Design solutions, we call them digital solutions. Same thing, but just related more to digital technologies. Oops. OK, so within this, we again have content. Same two organizing strands, knowledge and understanding, and processes and production skills. Pretty much exactly the same in terms of the processes. Um, in terms of knowledge and understanding, it's more focused on information and data um, and transforming data into solutions and meeting the needs of individual society and economy and all the rest. But essentially, it's the same as what we do in de design and technology, just we're now doing it within a digital technologies framework. Um, the sub strands are the same, except in um, knowledge and understanding, we have digital systems and data representation. They represent the core of, of the knowledge and understanding. Doesn't really give a good flavor of digital technologies as you'll come to understand the content of the subject. But that's how they're framed in terms of strands. Digital systems and data representation. And then the processes and production skills are all the same as what we saw in design and technology. Um, they just go through the same design process. Uh, the only additional aspect is privacy and security is another additional um, element of the su or substrand um, because in digital technologies, we have more of a focus on um, protecting data and being um, safe online and things of that nature, which we don't necessarily have to worry about in design and technology. OK, so same basic processes, um, iterative processes around coming up with digital solutions. It's taking a long time. Yeah. OK, and as I mentioned, the two main substrands of knowledge and understanding are data representation and digital systems. 
data representation looks at how we symbolically or structure symbolically information. Um, we use symbols to represent information. Uh, the most common example is binary, where we use ones and zeros to represent numbers and letters. Um, and there's a range of other things that we'll explore as we go through the content aspect of the course. And then we look at also different types of data. Data isn't just numbers or text. It also includes images and movies and sound, anything that can be stored um, and can be represented in different ways. And then we have digital systems. Yes, you will need to teach students about computers, about how the internet works, about how software works. Again, at a relatively low level. So many of you will already know probably enough about the hardware side of things. There'll be a few little things that will probably be new to you. We're quite a bit new around software that we'll be exploring. And there'll be a fair bit new around networks. How does the internet work? How does your mobile phone work? How does it connect and transmit data? How is that different to transmitting voice? There are a few different things that we'll be exploring. Processes and production, just the same as design and technology, um, but we're creating digital solutions instead of design solutions. So again, while in design technology, we might be making gardens and uh, different types of food and uh, catapults and things like that. In digital technology, you might be making computer games or programming a robot to perform various tasks, creating a website, creating a digital animation, things of that nature. Okay, so again, those processes and production skills, same as in design technology, except privacy and security is something new. So we'll just go th through them. Um, oh, and we also have in, in the addition, um, acquiring, managing and analyzing data. So acquiring, managing, analyzing data um, allows students to learn about how to, how we first off get data, um, particularly with digital technologies. So yes, they could fill in, have people could fill in a form or could have a spreadsheet um, we could create an online survey, but also we can use um, systems to automate collection of data. We could have a temperature sensor that measures temperature um, once an hour and collect the data that way. We could have a water sensor that measures um, water quality. There can be a range of different ways we can acquire data other than just um, entering it into some sort of system manually. We can also acquire images through various ways. Um, so, but again, we'll be exploring that. Um, once the data has been acquired, though, we then need to manage it. Um, we have databases and spreadsheets and other systems that we can use to be able to sort the data, to put it into different categories, to um, allow us to actually manage that data in a more effective way. And then we have to be able to analyze that data. Just collecting it and storing it and managing it is not sufficient. We actually have to do something with that data. We have to be able to analyze it. And again, we'll be looking at some ways of doing that. And it also in includes a lot of aspects of computational thinking, particularly around pattern recognition and abstraction and evaluation and things we'll be going into as we progress through the course. Okay, but again, students are go through that investigate, define process, um, generate and design their solutions, produce and implement their solutions. Remembering they're not all just products, they can be systems and also environments, um, creating a virtual world, such as in Minecraft, where people can come in and, and do and solve uh, problems using that space. Um, creating a computer game, creating a database to track um, teacher absences. Um, there can be a whole range of different things that uh, can fall into the types of solutions that can be created in digital in digital technologies. And we're going to be going through, in, particularly in the second half of this course, looking at many of those. Okay. Um, 
I'll let you think through those. They're all pretty much the same as with design and technology. Till we come to privacy and security. Um, where we need to then focus more on some specific, it's probably more knowledge about processes than part of a design process. But some students can design systems that can incorporate privacy, particularly when we start thinking of them as processes and systems, not just uh, products. So they may be, um, has a design challenge to come up with a system to ensure that their data is secure. So it may be, making regular backups once a day, um, storing those backups in different locations, having a password on their data files so that their sister can't get access and change their um, diary. Various systematic solutions to problems related to digital technologies. They might look at how to reduce their um, or and manage their digital footprint in terms of how people perceive them if they search for them on the internet. Um, what, what is found out about them? What is found out about their teachers? Uh, so there are various techniques that we can use and processes that can help manage that. And students can learn about those um, through digital technologies. Of course, they need to learn all about security protocols, um, how to have accounts, usernames, passwords, big challenge for um, foundation students and students in years one and two. Um, and one of the interesting things that you're going to experience as a teacher, um, but having those as a solution that students develop can be a way of addressing one of the bains that you'll have in your teaching life of students forgetting their passwords and not being able to access um, various tools and technologies as you require them. But that can be a challenge in itself. And it can be a challenge that you can give to your students as a learning activity to help them understand the importance of security, the importance of remembering their passwords, the importance of crafting passwords that can be remembered, but also ones that their friends can't guess or various other um, techniques can be used to break those passwords and get access to their information. But indeed, even why we want to password things, students need to understand those concepts and understand them. And then in later years, um, we start looking at multi-factor authentication and why we have to use our mobile phones to access certain things um, rather than just putting in a password and other more complex aspects of privacy and security. Okay, so again, there are some core concepts. Many of these are ones that we've just explored, um, but a couple of additional. Um, digital systems and abstraction, and also going into a bit more detail around data representation, data acquisition, data interpretation. We also have specifications and algorithms and the implementation of solutions in digital technologies and then privacy and security. So these form the main concepts that students need to understand. So learning about binary and hardware and networks and so forth, um, how to represent data, in different ways and how different people can use that data for different purposes um, and how we can store that and make it more easy for people to use. There's lots of different things to learn in that respect. How we can acquire data, um, categorize and st structure it, and calculate things using that data to create information. Um, how do we interpret and extract meaning from the data? How we can abstract and by reducing the complexity and this is one definition of abstraction and we're going to explore a few others during the course that allows us to then be able to um, engage with information in different ways then we have specifications being able to break down problems and specify them um, and make them manageable through a process called decomposition how computers use algorithms to automate processes so that they can go through a series of steps to um, have something occur. How we implement these algorithms using computer programs. Privacy and security, as we've been talking about. 
and time for another break. And then when you come back, we'll explore the general capabilities. Okay, so in the Australian curriculum, we have the learning areas, which comprise things like mathematics and um, languages, science, the technologies. And within the technologies, of course, we have our subjects. But then we also have a parallel curriculum called the general capabilities. Now, the subjects have their place to play within what students learn, what we call the curriculum. Curriculum simply means decisions around what students should learn. But it's not everything that they need to learn because it's mostly focused around particular subjects which are related to often professions such as um, becoming mathematicians or scientists or artists or um, sports persons. But there's a lot of additional things that we want students to learn that go across all of the subjects that are important in all of them. And we call these the general capabilities. And they're the responsibility of every teacher for every subject. Now, in primary, it's a bit easier to understand. As primary school teachers, you will pretty much be teaching all of your subjects to all of your students, including the general capabilities. In a perfect world. In reality, there'll probably be some specialist teachers that you'll have. There might be some music teachers that will look after music. Sometimes there might be science specialists. Sometimes there might be digital technology specialists or technologies learning area specialists. Um, but in the main, primary schools are generalists, where you teach all of the learning areas to all of your students. You incorporate all of the general capabilities as a natural part of that, all done in a wonderfully integrated way, um, and everything's happy and fun. Doesn't always happen that way, but that's sort of the ideal. In secondary school, of course, they are broken into subjects and teachers often only teach one or two subjects. Um, and in that case, the general capabilities are much more important. Of course, every teacher in all subjects is has to teach the general capabilities in addition to their specialist subjects. Okay, so the general capabilities are taught and assessed through the content of the learning areas. So you don't teach them separately. You teach them while you teach the your subject, your, your um, learning area subjects. Oops. So in general, the general capabilities are developed and support all of the learning areas. So one of the subjects or general capabilities that we're going to be focusing on is the um, digital literacy. Now, it incorporates some aspects of technology that are used in all learning areas, be you teaching mathematics or health and PE or geography. There are some aspects of digital technologies that you have opportunities to teach students. Um, but likewise, when you're teaching design and technology and digital technologies, there'll be opportunities to teach some aspects of literacy and numeracy. So, oops, um, there are a few key ones that I want to focus on in this course. We're not going to look at all the general capabilities, but the, the three critical ones are um, creative, critical and creative thinking, which is where students learn uh, particular ways of thinking about the world, um, being able to analyze and assess possibilities against criteria for judgment and to construct and evaluate arguments, use information, evidence and logic and draw reason, conclusions and solve problems. So a range of skills and approaches and ways of thinking about the world that are very useful when they're doing design and technology projects and digital technologies projects. So it allows students to generate and apply new ideas, to see existing situations in new ways, identify alternatives um, and possibilities, and create new links and generate successful outcomes. So really important in those creative aspects of generating ideas in technologies. 
but it also allows students to be more inquisitive or encourages students to be more inquisitive and reasonable, have intellectual flexibility, be open and fair-minded, and try new ways of doing things, and also develop persistence. Again, okay, all things that you should be able to see relate quite strongly to the technology subjects and their opportunities for students to develop their capacity around creative and critical thinking through doing these. So there are four elements of creative, sorry, critical and creative thinking, um, inquiring, generating, analyzing, and reflecting. So inquiring is broken into two bits. One is the student's ability to develop questions, to think of questions to ask. So if they're given a problem or they're looking at a problem to solve, what are some things that they need to ask about this problem? Are they going to go and ask the client or whoever's going to be um, affected by the problem or advantaged by the problem? Um, they might ask them, what are some things that are related to that problem? Why are they having difficulties with this or that? So that they can develop a solution to address that. So students being able to ask questions, develop questions, is an important aspect. Being able to identify, process, and evaluate information. Digital technologies has this as its fundamental, but it's also an important um, general capability where students need to know about how they can actually find out about things. Now, in digital technologies, we're going to explore how they can find out about things through digital means, but that doesn't preclude other ways. Going and asking their grandmother, going and asking their friends, going to the library, there are a whole range of different ways they can find out about stuff. And inquiring is a skill that they need to develop in that respect. Then they need to be able to generate ideas, creating possibilities, considering alternatives, and putting their ideas into actions. Again, you should see some strong parallels with the technologies learning area. They need to be able to analyze, um, interpret concepts and problems slightly differently to how we use the, the term analyze when we talk about digital technologies, where we analyze data. This is more broadly in terms of analyzing concepts and problems to be able to work out what are the important parts, what are the things that could be changed and how they get a deeper understanding of things. They need to be able to draw conclusions and to provide reasons for their conclusions. Why are they doing it? Why are they making their bird feeder with two holes to allow the birds to come into rather than one? What is their reasoning around that? They need to be able to evaluate their actions and what they produce and their outcomes. So has it produced the solution that they want to so wanted to? Why hasn't it? Again, these fit in very well with the technologies learning area but they are skills that students will be able to transfer and use in any context, in any learning area. Uh, they need to be able to reflect, think about their thinking. This is called metacognition. They need to be able to explain why they came, why they thought that way. So they've come up with a solution that's going to make the world a better place. How did they come up with that solution? What were they thinking about to decide to do it that way rather than some other ways? Were they using any of these other skills around thinking? Did they use any computational thinking or design thinking, or futures thinking or systems thinking? Did they use critical and um, critical thinking? So being able to um, talk about and understand their thinking is a very powerful educational tool. Um, it's a difficult one, uh, but there's been a lot of success where schools and students have focused on developing metacognition. They need to be also able to transfer knowledge, how to be able to take what they know and use it in other contexts. Um, take what they know about making paper planes in designer technology and use that when they come to learn about flight and the principles of flight in science or use it when they come to understand about geography and the dis distances between countries. These are things that they can transfer their knowledge about various concepts into other con um, contextual aspects of the curriculum. 
Okay, so critical and creative thinking has a few key connections to the technologies learning area, um, particularly around imagining, generating, iterating, and critically evaluating ideas, and around reasoning and the capacity for abstraction and challenging problems. Oh, sorry, and developing abstraction through the processes of completing challenging problems or design challenges. Now, the next general capability is one that is very much associated with the digital technologies subject in the technologies learning area. And this is digital literacy. Now, it used to be called the ICT general capability, but it's recently had a name change to digital literacy so that it can encompass more aspects of our lives, particularly around um, cyber safety. So in digital literacy, across all the learning areas, remember every subject is responsible for teaching this, not just technologies learning area and digital technologies. Students need to be able to create, manage, communicate, investigate data, information and ideas and solve problems and work collaboratively. Sounds fairly similar to what they do in digital technologies, but again, this is more generally applied across all learning areas. They need to be able to critically identify and appropriately select um, which particular digital devices to use or which systems to use for particular um, circumstances and problems. They need to be adaptable around different ways of doing things, particularly as technology evolves and they have to learn new technologies and how to protect themselves and others in digital environments. So there's four key elements of this, practicing digital safety and well-being, investigating, creating and exchanging, and managing and operating. So practicing digital safety and well-being involves managing online safety, digital privacy and identity, and digital well-being. Managing online safety involves students understanding the various technical, social, cognitive, communicative, and decision-making skills to address online risks. Now, as we all know, there are lots of risks involved in the use of technology, particularly around online technologies. There are online predators, there are hackers, there are viruses, there are a whole range of different threats. Um, and students need to understand those, um, but not just in a negative way, how to actually proactively um, utilize online safety for their own benefits and manage those processes. They need to understand the risks they face and the strategies involved in dealing with them. They need to manage their own digital privacy and identity about um, who shapes their digital um, representation and how they can shape that. They need to be able to create and curate their own line identities and have their own digital footprint rather than having that emerge from just their activity online. They need to be able to be able to actually shape that. And that's going to become more and more important into the future as various organizations commercialize the use of digital information about individuals and also how governments and society can utilize that. In schools, we've been using students' digital information or student information for many, many years, um, often without any protections on behalf of the students or their parents and so forth. But now there's, there are mechanisms to access that information much more broadly. There are more and more regulations being brought into place to protect students' um, information and their digital identity. And some of that is going to impact upon schools. Many of the practices we have in schools of collecting data about students and using that data, often without their express consent, will be challenged into the future. Hasn't been happening just quite yet, but there's certainly a large potential for that to occur. Um, and in schools, we'll have to adapt to the new norms in society, particularly around protecting the rights of children in relation to data. Oops. Okay, and students need to be able to consider the impact that they have on society and the world through their use of digital tools. We have things such as online bullying and some more express things like that, but also the fact that they might share things or make things available to be shared. Um, downloading a movie and 
leaving the sharing on to so others can then download that movie and contribute to more widespread downloading um, is something many don't consider or understand. So there can be a whole range of impacts that students can have um, that they need to come to an understanding of. And then there are some more specific things around digital well-being. We have things such as excessive screen time, uh, digital workloads, distractions, um, the effect of multitasking and how that can have on our learning and our health and our understanding, um, our cognitive processing. Um, so these are things that everyone is coming to grips with at the moment. Um, we don't have answers to all of these, but because they are going to be so significant in our students' lives, we have to start addressing them and have to start preparing our students to address them. Now remember, sometimes even if you don't have the answers yourself, you can still set it as a problem for students to investigate. So at least they know it's a problem and are starting to work towards a solution, even if solutions are not necessarily readily available. So the next is around investigating. And there are three sub elements again, locating information, acquiring and collating data and interpreting data. And we've pretty much talked through those already. Oops. Acquiring and collect, collating, and then interpreting the data, looking for trends and patterns, and we're going to be exploring some of the processes and activities related to those. Then we have creating and exchanging, planning, creating, communicating, and collaborating, and respecting intellectual property. Again, remember, these are things across all subject areas. Yes, we have to teach these in digital technologies, but in digital technology, we tend to go a bit further, um, looking at the actual processes behind the technology. Um, in the other subject areas, it's generally more done in terms of its use and impact. But students need to be able to plan their use of technology, um, understanding the constraints and risks around that technology. And in some of our schools, there will be constraints as to what technologies they have access to and can utilize. And as a teacher, when you go out onto practicums, you're going to face many of those constraints where many of the digital tools and websites and other resources you may wish to use in that environment may not be available because of various constraints placed upon that system in order to protect the well-being of our students. And we also need to understand the risks so that we can then argue for and mitigate and appropriately um, plan to use various technologies. You'd be able to create, communicate and collaborate and decide which of our various um, technologies are best for doing different tasks. Is a PowerPoint presentation the best way? Is a website the best way? Is a digital animation the best way of communicating a particular idea? Is a spreadsheet or a database the best way? An infographic, um, a mind map, two of the activities you'll be doing this week. We need to also respect intellectual property. Again, something we don't do well as teachers um, and our students don't do particularly well either. Now, students have actual rights around the use of intellectual property of others. Um, and when they're being used for teaching or for learning purposes, they can actually do things that normal people can't do. That needs to be understood. Um, in some instances and in some countries, teachers have rights to use various information and resources for teaching purposes. Unfortunately, not in Australia at the moment, but that's something we're hoping to address. Um, the moment we need licenses and particular um, accreditation processes to enable teachers to be able to use our, our digital resources and various, various information resources. And that has to be renewed quite regularly. And sometimes it's in place and not in place. And it's a little bit of a minefield. Uh, we don't have fair use provisions here in Australia for educational purposes of information and intellectual property yet. But that will hopefully be addressed in the next, well, let's hope for a decade. Uh, it's taken a few decades already. Um, but students need to understand once they need to apply these um, protections that people do own these this information. People do own the movie that they might be downloading or the or the music clip, or the web page, or the computer game. And we also need 
to recognize the ownership of information. When they want to take a paragraph of off the internet and use it in their writing, that they need to acknowledge that and credit the author. Um, so there are various processes around that that they need to slowly develop an understanding of. And again, this is done throughout their schooling across all of their learning areas, all their subjects. So it's not something you have to worry about encompassing everything at once. It's done gradually and progressively. Need to be able to manage and operate information, um, managing content, protecting content, and selecting and operating tools. So how they interact with information and data, how they save it, regular patterns of saving, um, how they can retrieve that data, all these various aspects are important, particularly in the younger years, when they may not understand the processes of saving or how to retrieve it, or how information can be stored in multiple places or could be moved from one place to another. These are things that students need to learn about. Yes, they may be quite familiar with doing very specific things that they've learned how to do, but having a more general, broad understanding of how to do all of these processes, many of them will still lack. They need to be able to protect their content from potential threats using passwords and various other approaches and use technology without compromising their data and devices. And a big one is selecting and operating the various tools that they might wish to use to do various things. Is the word processor the best tool for that? Or should we use using some sort of web page publishing tool? Is making a computer game or using a computer game to learn that the best tool, or is it better to use some other um, digital tool? So this is all part of evaluating and understanding what's available, but also about what strengths and weaknesses various digital tools have and making a discerning decision around which to utilize. Okay, so again, there are various key connections to these technologies to the sorry, various key connections to digital literacy, to the technologies learning area. Um, and these are around developing students' ability to be discerning users, productive creators, critical analysts, and effective developers of digital solutions. Um, one aspect of all the technologies learning area is that we need a context in which to apply our technologies. Technologies are generally tools so you use a tool to do something. So you use a word processor to write something for some purpose. You create a garden to grow food for some purpose. Um, you create a computer game to it might just be for entertainment or it might be to learn something. But we need a context around creating the solution for something. Um, and again, students need to be able to operate and manage digital systems and practice digital safety and well-being, investigate, create, and communicate all of these things that we do in great detail in the technologies learning area. So again, just emphasizing this is done across all the learning areas. Okay, so again, some key connections, um, investigating needs and opportunities and researching and anal analyzing information are probably the, the key beneficial aspects of the um, technologies learning area, or oh, sorry, digital literacy to the technologies learning area, but also around the problem solving process or the design um, process and how we can plan and manage our um, project management and teamwork processes. Now, the final general capability that we're going to discuss in this course is ethical understanding. Um, with a renewed focus in digital literacies on ethical understanding and in digital technologies, a big focus as well, um, the ethical understanding general capability provides us with another framework to help build students' capacity to make ethical decisions. Um, so there's a range of different elements within developing an ethical um, outlook that students need to um, develop. Again, over the many years of their schooling, and this will help shape their values and their behavior in many respects. So students will explore various ethical issues, and there are lots of ethical issues that can be incorporated into the technologies learning area. 
Is it right to build a dam? Building a dam is a great design and technology project. What will be the impacts? What are the ethical considerations around building a dam? Impact upon the environment, impact upon society, impact upon the um, local power industry. Um, in digital technologies, again, many, many ethical conundrums that can be explored. Uh, is it right for an automated um, self-driving car to make decisions as to what happens if it's in a dangerous situation? Should it drive off the cliff in order to save running into a school bus? These are things that ethicists are considering at the moment. And our students can explore ethical issues likewise, not necessarily to solve them, but to develop their own ethical understanding and their capacity to make ethical decisions. And again, within ethical understanding, there are two um, elements, understanding ethical concepts and perspectives and responding to ethical issues. Within um, understanding ethical concepts and perspectives, there are three sub-elements, exploring ethical concepts, examining rights, values, responsibilities, and ethical norms, and recognizing the influences of ethical behavior and our perspectives. So exploring ethical concepts is basically looking at different situations when ethical decisions need to arise and what actions we have within those situations. Uh, the values and rights and responsibilities and norms uh, help us understand the, the context of making these value decisions. Now this can be quite involved. Indeed, some people spend their entire lives um, trying to understand all of the philosophical ramifications of these issues. We don't go into that in anywhere near that detail. Essentially, we want students to start making considered decisions. So they're not just making um, uninformed, um, un or decisions that aren't discerned. So they need to actually think about things. Now, they may choose to do things that we would consider wrong. That's an ethical choice. And that can be something that can then be explored. Downloading music is a, a common one we explore. So that then relates to established norms. Uh, 20 years ago, downloading music was really, really bad. It was um, one of the big issues. The music industry adapted and evolved around that. But unfortunately, there'd been an established norm of making mixtapes um, back when uh, sharing music was relatively difficult. You had to have a tape recorder and press record when the song came on the radio and press stop. And it was a re relatively involved process. And you had one copy. So it wasn't a huge impact upon the industry. But then digital technologies came along. Suddenly your one copy could be made available online to a million people. And it rapidly was. Um, and of course, this disrupted the entire musical industry. And that then changed our perspectives on sharing of music. And for many years, it was opposed and we attempted to establish norms that that shouldn't happen. It was ethically immoral and illegal to share music in that way. That's somewhat changed. Um, still there, but it's not anywhere near as strongly focused. Our current focus is around the sharing of digital video. Um, and again, that's a game where the established norms are being worked through. Um, but these are things you can discuss with your students. Now, there are certain other established norms, such as cheating and uh, copying um, other students' assignments and so forth, which are generally considered um, wrong, <laughs> certainly by teachers. But again, that's an established norm that's being challenged at universities, where we have um, paper mills, where companies are formed to write assignments for students and things like that. So what was once considered clearly unethical behavior um, is now being challenged in terms of um, the norms of society. So ethics and rights and responsibilities and values are a moving feast. That's what makes them interesting to explore with students. If they were simply just rules, that would be easy. But having students understand that there are gray areas, there are issues that need to be considered and worked through and understood. And sometimes it is only our own personal view related to our behavior, our character, our feelings of obligation and duty 
that shape our ethical behaviour. And they may be different to others. Children need to understand that, though, so that we can understand difference. If we simply take the, the uh, stance that our ethical framework needs to be imposed upon others, then that is a source of conflict. So we need to um, approach this whole area through various lenses and um, perspectives. And how we respond to these ethical issues is part of that. Um, having an ethical framework, exploring ethical issues, and making and reflecting on our own ethical decisions. So understanding that people have different ethical frameworks. When you're working in a team, you need to establish potentially an ethical framework. Does the computer game you're making going to include violence? That's an ethical decision. Um, there can be a whole range of different approaches that can be done in that respect. We need to look at the consequences of those. If it does include violence, what might that entail? What could happen if that then promotes violence? Um, but again, it often comes back to our understanding of duty, justice, fairness, and our own virtues that decide upon these things. And sometimes they need to be shared and talked out with our teammates and worked out through a consensus. And exploring ethical issues is our approaches we use to look at these different questions. And it's done within the context of our subjects, um, but just recognizing them and incorporating them and looking at potential outcomes. Now, in technology education, we've built that into the design cycle. And in particular, for digital technologies, we've gone a bit further, but looking at the potential impact of our decisions and the ethical decision-making around that is a key part of the technologies learning area. So again, the, this all links back into the technologies learning area in various ways. One aspect that you need to sort of consider, particularly in primary, is looking at whether or not it relates to past, current and future ethical perspectives, how things have been done in the past, how they might be done in the future, or are you just focusing on how they're being done now? Of course, our ethical perspectives have changed. Our understanding of the role of women has changed. Our understanding of slavery has changed. There are various ethical perspectives that once what was once ethically okay is no longer ethically okay. And then we also need to look at the, the context of our ethical decision making. Are we just looking at how it impacts locally, how it might affect them with their family and their friends or their teacher, or we are looking at how it might impact their community or their entire country, or indeed how it might infect, impact things globally. And these again are developed as students progress in their age levels. And finally, it's all around students being able to make discerning decisions around their behaviour, but also the technologies that they're incorporating, but also the behaviour of others. When is it possible to identify that something is being done wrong, even if it is socially acceptable? And there, have, of course, been many cases. Um, Nazi Germany is a good case where it was quite a societal norm for various things to be occurring in that society that were from other perspectives, quite ethically problematic. Um, and we need to consider those. And we need to consider that we are mo as likely to be um, doing things ethically questionable um, as others. Um, and in society at any point in time, there are various debates going on around that. Um, we've had quite a lot of debate in recent years around same-sex marriages. Um, and the ethics and processes around that. There's a whole range of debates happening around um, trans, transgender um, athletes and how that's playing out in the sporting arena. So there's lots of different things that can be explored around ethics. Euthanasia, not a common one that's explored in ethical decision-making. And as part of all that, students will learn to appreciate and value the part they play in society and in nature and their role and responsibilities as citizens and being able to detect bias and inaccuracies. Um, again, something that's quite topical at the moment, um, with all of this ability to share information and to express views online. We're also seeing people share things sometimes dishonestly, sometimes through ignorance, 
but often incorrectly. And that is having an impact. Certainly it's had a significant impact around the climate change debates and discussions. So that's some key aspects around ethics. Now, what I want to discuss as we wrap things up for this week is what's going to occur in your tutorials. So in your tutorials, we have each week a scheduled workshop where you will participate in the technologies learning area or technologies activities. And they will model various learning and teaching processes. Um, some activities you'll need to prepare for beforehand. Uh, this week, you're being asked to prepare an infographic or a mind map that summarizes the technologies learning area. And we'll be using that as part of your discussions in the tutorial. Um, also, your tutorial activities are directly related to your course assessment. Firstly, you need to um, submit your activities to gain your um, uh, log of learning activities uh, points. And you'll also be selecting some of the activities to develop in more detail as part of your portfolio of learning. So it's important that you engage with the activities and um, participate as much as you can in contributing to our discussions around the activities. So for the tutorial for this week, um, you need to create an infographical mind map um, that shows your understanding of the technologies learning area. Um, generally, it shouldn't be more than a couple of pages long. Uh, I'm not going to set any specific length, but I don't want you just copying everything that's been presented and submitting that. That's not the point. The process is for you to be discerning and to make choices about what's important, what you consider important about what's been presented and to present that in a way that is relatively easy to understand and di digest, essentially to summarize. Now you can either use a mind map or a concept map um, or an infographic to put the key points down. Um, I want you to do those techniques because one, we often use them in, in technologies education, ways of representing information and presenting information, but also so that you summarize. Um, both of those techniques, you can't put everything in. Um, so the idea is not to um, re repeat everything that's been um, presented. It's to make some decisions. It also relates to um, the year one and two learning outcome, generating and designing and communicating design ideas through describing drawing and modeling, including using digital tools. Uh, so key aspect of that, you need to share that in two locations. One is in Microsoft Teams, simply post it as a, a posting, or if you see other people posting, you can do it as replies to theirs. Um, that's so that we can all share and um, look at how different people have approached their summaries in different ways and discuss those in the tutorials. The second is so that you can receive a mark for it. Um, you need to post it onto Learning at Griffith. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have an online tool yet that is good for discussions and good for assessment. Um, that will come hopefully in our new systems, but for the moment, uh, you need to post it in those two locations. It could be the same thing, just posted twice. Um, I provided you with a couple of um, suggested tools. Um, you'll find links to those on the course website. Canva, Visime are used often for making infographics. There are hundreds of other online tools for doing that. You can also use various other word processors and other tools. Um, MindMeister is, again, one of the common ones used for creating mind maps or concept maps. Um, and again, but again, there are several others, dozens of others as well. So the idea of this is for you to dis is to you to show your understanding of the technologies learning area, not your comprehensive understanding. I keep stressing that. Um, but what are the key things that you've taken away from our discussions? Um, these are just two simple examples. That's a mind map of mind maps and an infographic of infographics. Um, 
But again, there are many different ways of doing it. These are just two. Don't be constrained by these particular examples. Um, there's no hard and fast rules around infographics and mind maps. There are many different ways of presenting the information across. And remember, you're not marked on the quality of your infographics or your mind maps. You'll be assessed on whether or not you've actually just done them. Unless you decide to use this as one of your elements that you develop into a major um, activity for your portfolio, but that's different. We'll talk about that as we progress through. Okay, during the tutorial, um, you're going to be exploring some concepts around digital technologies of sequencing. Now, this is where we have students learn the idea that things will occur in a sequence. It's one of the fundamental concepts of algorithmic thinking. We'll be learning more about that a bit later, but for the tutorial activities, you're going to look at a um, little computer game that explores the teaching of sequence. And we're going to be using some robots, some very nice, simple robots called V-Bots. And these will also be used to explore concepts of sequence. Um, and for those on campus, we'll have the robots for you to use. And um, we'll be using various mats that the robots move around on and to do various learning activities. And you will take some photos of your activities, or sorry, you'll create an activity, suggest an activity, and share that on um, Teams and into Learning at Griffith as evidence of you having done the activity, uh, where you describe an activity using the B-Bots. So you'll be tasked with thinking of a teaching and learning activity that could utilize various mats or B-Bots and to explain that um, that's just one of the other B-Bot mats. Now, for those online, doing the online course, we have an online B-Bot simulator um, that also has various mats that you can select from, and you can program your online B-Bot to move around the, bat, the mat as well and come up with an activity and take a screenshot and share that into Microsoft Teams and Learning at Griffith as evidence of you having done that particular activity. But your tutors will take you through these and will explain the various contexts around learning about sequencing and using robots for teaching various concepts as part of your tutorial process. So that's it. Been a lot of information this week. It does get less <laughs> slowly, but I hope you've come to some understanding of the technologies learning area. And as you create your infographic and your or your mind map, you'll summarize some of these ideas and bring that into a bit more focus for you. Of course, the curriculum forms the foundation of all of the things we're going to be doing over the next 12 weeks, exploring how to teach digital technologies.